thank you for joining. I'm Dean Felk, and I'm a trustee of World Affairs, and we're very pleased to have many of you in person and some of you joining at home as well for this discussion with our distinguished guest, Ambassador Chantel Wong. And um, we couldn't be more thrilled to have this discussion, and we think it's, it's going to be very relevant um, and interesting. Um, the CEO of World Affairs, um, Philip Yon, is unfortunately not able to join us tonight because he is called um, to urgent business on the East Coast, um, but he sends his very warm regards, Ambassador, to you. Of course, you are longtime friends, uh, and we are thrilled that he was able to arrange and you were able to take time off uh, from your very busy uh, schedule to join us tonight. And, of course, many of you will know that um, World Affairs is um, a place that really, I think, challenges us to open our minds to the world and, 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 and learn about the world around us. But even more than that, it really gives us the opportunity to take some personal action and kind of find our inner uh, citizen states person. And so, uh, in addition to these kinds of forums, um, you'll know that we also do um, real action-oriented uh, projects and programming, right? Including the Global Philanthropy Forum, um, a special shout out to our high school students who are here today and who've uh, taken part in our international relations educational program. Uh, and of course, our nationally uh, syndicated podcast and radio show entitled, What Else? World Affairs, mm -hmm. uh, in partnership with uh, KQED. So with that, I would like to say that uh, Ambassador Wong, in, uh, in some ways, needs little introduction. Um, she has spent 30 years as, as a trailblazer, um, as a leader in government, um, we'll hear a little bit more about her work uh, as, a, as a photographer, um, but she has really spent a career at the highest echelons of government and really um, tearing down barriers along the way. Um, she's currently serving as the U.S. Executive Director for the Asian Development Bank, um, and in that capacity, she is one of the highest ranking U.S. leaders in Asia um, in international and ec economic policy. She's also the first uh, LGBTQ person of color to ever, ever hold the rank of ambassador in the US. Hard, it's, it, it's, it's actually um, hard to believe that's true, but, um, but that is really so much of uh, Ambassador Wong's amazing journey, which we're gonna hear about um, tonight. So I could go on and on, but I won't embarrass you uh, in doing so, apart from saying that uh, it's been an incredible journey. We look forward to hearing more. So I think with that, uh, can we give Ambassador Wong a warm welcome? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So maybe we will start with, we'll start with the personal journey. We're not going to start at birth, but maybe we'll start... <laughs> Maybe we'll start at age six, because I know at age six, just an incredible story and thinking about um, the Mao Zedong era and what was going on. And I know you you had left the PRC, I understand. And I don't know if it was said that you were smuggled out. I don't know if it's quite that, but but at least you you, you left in, 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 a, in a boat. And what was that journey like and what do you remember? Well, thank you, Dean. Thank you uh, to the World Affairs Council for, for having me. Uh, I, I, uh, Phil and I did talk about doing this uh, months ago before I was confirmed, uh, and uh, now it's really happened, but he's not here. <laughs> uh, but let me, let me just uh, take a moment yeah. to uh, reflect a little bit about uh, someone that has uh, been significant in my life uh, and significant in many of our lives, and, and that is Norm Mineta. Uh, who just passed away, uh, and, and where the world is sad, and um, because of that, um, and that uh, he was uh, definitely a trailblazer uh, in his right. Uh, many 
of us follow in his footsteps, learned a lot of lessons uh, from him uh, while being very young and, and green in Washington. He took us in, many of us, uh, and so I am uh, particularly saddened uh, personally uh, at his passing. Um, so going back to, uh, yeah, age six, um, uh, my sister is here with me, by the way. <laughs> she she knows this. It was actually uh, her fault uh, because uh, um, we're basically uh, first cousins, uh, but it was uh, her mother uh, who uh, decided uh, that uh, it was uh, time for me to, to leave uh, the, the China at the time. It was uh, the Great Leap Forward campaign. Uh, upwards of 55 million people were uh, died of starvation. My parents made the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, with my grandmother, we were uh, smuggled out in the bottom of a boat uh, into Hong Kong, where Connie's uh, parents really uh, took care of me and raised me, and we're, we're sisters <laughs> uh, because of that. Uh, and, and I'm very grateful uh, for that, uh, my, for what my parents did. Uh, allowing me to uh, leave, because my generation, those that did stay, uh, we call it uh, a sheet of red. All of us were to go out into the countryside uh, to tilt the land uh, and to to uh, uh, be the part of the agricultural uh, uh, revival of the of the country. Uh, so I would not be here today if that had not happened. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, I came out uh, with with my grandmother, uh, went to Hong Kong. In those days, actually, Hong Kong, uh, lots of people were escaping from Hong Kong, uh, and the, the Chinese government was making uh, examples of them uh, floating their bodies into Hong Kong Harbor. Mm. Uh, uh, so if you dare to escape, this is the fate you will uh, meet. So I was very lucky I didn't have that. Uh, but but uh, yeah, um, and from there on, uh, we we were in. Uh, I went to boarding school in in Macau. Uh, the nuns uh, basically uh, nurtured me and shaped me. Uh, but it's very interesting uh, in in that uh, um, my name used to be Irene, uh, and when I went to register at the school in Macau, it's a boarding school, all girls boarding school, and they say, oh, we got too many Irene's here. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe Chantel, because uh, it's the, 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 the woman that had the name graduated, so there's a free name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so what about Chantel? Uh, so uh, I spent, uh, it, in those days, it was a, a four-hour boat ride. Nowadays, it's one one hour hydrofoil, right, from Hong Kong to, to Macau. It was four four hours long, and I spent uh, that f those four hours learning to write the word Chantel and spelling my name. That was the first Western word I ever learned was, was my name. Uh, uh, there, you know, it was a, as a Catholic uh, boarding school, um, and as I said, nuns, priests, all really uh, nurtured me, uh, gave me the name Chantel. It turns out Chantel is the, uh, uh, I, I was baptized with uh, the name Chantel, Saint Jane de Chantel. And uh, those of you that may know, uh, uh, the, the pat she's the patron saint of uh, the forgotten people. Uh, so aptly named, uh, I just discovered that actually <laughs> more recently as I was uh, going through confirmation, the, the nuns uh, that took care of me uh, and nurtured me in, in Guam. I went to high school in Guam, uh, wrote a really beautiful piece supporting my confirmation uh, that uh, really taught me about the word Chantel, the, the name Chantel. So I, I had no idea, uh, but certainly now I, I now carry that responsibility uh, to really take care of the forgotten people. And it seems like you were drawn towards engineering, which is, which is perhaps wasn't as typical, and, and maybe it isn't even typical today, it's a very kind of perhaps male-dominated. What, 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 what pulled you in that, in that direction, and what was the, ex the experience like? Um, actually, it, it was somewhat of a non-choice. Uh, Connie and I were in, uh, I was in high school uh, uh, in Guam. Uh, Connie's mother who raised me, um, 
passed away between my junior and my senior year. Um, we were both very young, uh, and um, uh, my my uh, uh, I was uh, asked to you know basically figure out how to take care of myself from then on, uh, and uh, I found a, a an organization called the Society of American uh, Military Engineers. They had a scholarship, uh, and so. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's the only way I could get to go to college. Uh, I would apply for that, um, and uh, then the the governor of Guam was was uh, very generous in helping me write a letter of uh, recommendation, uh, and that's how I got to go to college. Uh, so it was, was quite an accident, uh, but it is it is uh, quite interesting because I went to uh, college in in um, uh, at the University of Hawaii. Uh, in those days, uh, 1976 um, uh, to 1980, there weren't very many women engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the building that we were in, uh, the engineering building, uh, women's bathrooms were on every other floor. Mm -hmm. So when you got out of class and you need to go to the bathroom, you have to figure out which floor you were <laughs> on. <laughs> do you go up? Do you go down? Do you go, you know, uh, to to find a bathroom, um, and and uh, those were definitely challenging days, uh, picking or accidentally picking a, a career that that is uh, very much male dominated, um, and even actually, uh, so going forward, uh, I actually got a degree in uh, environmental engineering, uh, water and wastewater. At from Berkeley, uh, and my first job was for the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, and some of you may know uh, that's a very male-dominating, dominated, dominated uh, uh, place uh, at a sewage treatment plant, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> who would who would guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, in those kind of situations, uh, what what is the? I mean, what what is the way forward? I mean. Um, yeah, th th you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's very hard to, as a young Asian petite woman to come in to tell these, uh, men that, that no, don't do it that way or t t turn a knob over here versus go read the instrument over there. Uh, it, 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 it really is, uh, and many women know that, that, uh, you have to do your homework. You have to know exactly what what you're asking for, uh, you have to be that much better, uh, and under knowing, you, you know, why, giving the reasons why, and doing that homework uh, is really what carries the day to make sure that we don't upset the sewage treatment process. <laughs> Which none of us want, <laughs> definitely. <No. laughs> <laughs> okay, so then, okay, so you, but you, you, ultimately make your way to Washington, D.C., and this begins a very long, you know, successful career, it really in policy and leadership. So what is, what, what caused you perhaps to make, to want to pivot from, oh. the, from the glamour of waste management? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I talked about that with the students uh, earlier today. Uh, it's really an evolution because uh, what I've discovered uh, even being in uh, operating a sewage treatment plant, it was those people that designed them that have never really been on the ground operating a sewage treatment plant, putting a design uh, where you have to read a, a, a gauge that is on the piece of paper looks great, but you have to climb up 10 flights of stairs to read it uh, every hour on the hour. That didn't make any sense. So I spent some time in after operating going into designing, uh, and then once you did the design work and you've got uh, folks that are in the community that don't want it in their c community, I know uh, Fiona knows a lot about this, uh, where uh, you you have to really go and, uh, um, you know, where where the money is following that to do, that. that's an evolution, understanding um, uh, how to go about teaching uh, or actually, I was there to provide sewer tours <laughs> to in the in the community to ensure that this the, the reasons why we're building these sewage treatment plant here it is because we want to clean up uh, the, the 
the yeah. sewage. Uh, and, and then uh, I discovered that uh, uh, we did all of that well, uh, but those uh, crazy people in Washington come up with <laughs> challenging regulations and laws that don't make any sense at right. the local level. Uh, I said, I'm going to go Washing to Washington to fix this problem. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I ended up in Washington. <laughs> And, and the first role in D.C., am I correct in saying it, it was with the Environmental Protection Agency? With EPA, that's right. Yep. Uh, and in those days, uh, it was uh, the Bush administration, uh, early Bush administration, and I was uh, asked to, to go work in uh, the environment, uh, environmental policy uh, in, a, uh, in an administration that may want to cut programs uh, that I wanted to be advocating for. So... Um, uh, but I discovered uh, I, I had a mentor, uh, Alice Rivlin. Many of you may know her. Uh, she basically told me, "Look, the the skills you develop at uh, the Office of Management and Budget, which is where where I st started out uh, at, uh, will carry you f for life." And that's basically what I did. Uh, my 30-year career or 23-year career in the federal government has been in budget finance. Yeah. Uh, and that leads to everything. <laughs> everything needs funding, right? Everything needs funding. Um, you, yes. I, was, I mean, you talk so much, or you have spoken before about mentorship, being being both a mentor and a mentee, and Alice Rivlin in particular, who I think for, you know, for many, um, long storied career, and I, I think the first female head of OMB, is that yes, right? Yes, that's right. She was the first director of the Congressional Budget Office, uh, for which she actually won a MacArthur Genius Award. Uh, and she was also the first female uh, uh, OMB director. Uh, she became uh, the vice chair of the Federal Reserve uh, under Greenspan. Uh, she is the one that during the uh, Johnson administration, early, early on, uh, she Johnson had the war on poverty. She was the one that defined what poverty is. Uh, what poverty meant. So uh, that is the person I <laughs> that nurtured me and was my mentor for 30 years. Incredible. Very lucky. What kind of things could she help you understand about overcoming challenges or break, breaking glass, you know, glass ceiling? Yeah. She, well, it's all about doing the homework, the analysis, the data, the evidence, and that's how we win the argument and win the, win the policy uh, choices. Uh, and uh, that's what I learned from her. It's always about the, the, the evidence. Staying with, I think, mentorship just for a moment, because I've heard so much about this incredible uh, organization, with the, which, I, which I know you established and have built the uh, Council for the Asian uh, Pacific American Leadership. And so what is it that you now want to take forward in terms of those lessons of mentorship in terms of particularly in the, in the Asian, you know, Asian American community, but also beyond? Yeah, and uh, I know uh, some friends are here that were part of the, the, when we started this, when we got to Washington, uh, we didn't see very many Asian Americans uh, in, in uh, whether it's leadership roles, but actually at the table when resources are being allocated, decisions are being made on immigration, on uh, uh, health, on education. These are all issues that impact our community, but we're not there as part of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, decision makers. Uh, so we see we saw a, a huge lack in that, and uh, that's why we we brought together. Uh, um, Organize, uh, put together an organization to encourage young Asian Americans to seek careers in, in public service. That's actually uh, anti to many uh, Asian parents who want you to be a, a mother, uh, a doctor, a lawyer, uh, right, <laughs> engineer. Uh, we were trying to change that mantra, <laughs> go against that mantra, uh, and that public service is indeed a higher calling, uh, and that public service uh, does, uh, uh, is good, it's a good, career path. 
Ha have we seen either statistics or great anecdotes about you know first and generation first and second generation Americans that say you know I, I do want to be in public life and I do want to be a leader and and you know and sort of press forward for our voice. Is this something or is this a is this a perennial? No, I I think uh, it. We, we call it uh, Potomac fever. We think that once you come to Washington, you get a taste of being in the policy arena, you want to come back. And so over 33 years of this organization in existence, we actually have uh, uh, major leaders. Like in this, in this environment, you know David Chu. Uh, David Chu yeah. was an intern. Uh, Grace Meng was an was a intern. Uh, and we have judges like Lucy Ko, uh, maybe some of you know who she is. Uh, she was a, 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 a intern. So this organization uh, really uh, for gener has several generations now. Uh, I I always like to call it uh, very proud that that I was part of the start in in my basement apartment. We started it, um, and uh, I call it uh, all all of those out there uh, my mini me's. <laughs> uh, and I've nurtured and certainly mentored a lot of them along the way. That's wonderful. Okay, so you, but but your your path in public service includes a lot of a lot of stops along the way, and I, I won't I won't get the chronology right, but. I know it includes in, it includes EPA and OMB and Interior and Treasury and Millennium Challenge Corporation. Is there anywhere in government that you haven't worked? First of all, well, it sounds like I couldn't keep a job, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so all of those uh, actually, it's been a uh, again, it's also an evolution. You know, I started out at the Treasury Department or. Uh, uh, where the, the Treasury Department is about the, as old as our republic uh, and, and processes and systems uh, have been, uh, the tires have been kicked and, and uh, we understand how to, you know, how to get things done. Uh, and then I got to, to NASA, uh, which is a 50-year-old uh, organization and where uh, it's designed by engineers, uh, but uh, the, it's still quite not there, uh, and, and I, I was running the, their, uh, I was the director of the budget uh, department at there. Um, and those were particular challenges uh, because they built, they built one of a kind things to go into space. Uh, uh, the Hubble telescope at the time I was there, now it's the James Webb telescope, right? It goes out 100 million miles out into space. Th these are, uh, the mission is incredible, but the systems and the processes that help lead you there is the, what's the most important piece. And so I learned from that on how do we do organizations, how do we uh, allocate resources to, to uh, better get efficiencies and effectiveness. And then, uh, sir, you talked about the Millennium Challenge Corporation. I was there for, uh, for three years, but it, it was, it's a 10-year-old organization. Uh, and we were designing them as we were going along. There was a lot of challenges. I was basically the COO of that organization. So I uh, learned from that. Uh, and then my last uh, stint was a one-year-old uh, at a data uh, tech startup, at, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> was was hugely challenging because uh, we weren't, I wasn't dealing with billions of dollars. It was Hundreds of dollars, which was a <laughs> <laughs> particular challenge. <laughs> Sometimes hundreds are, are more challenging than billions. A absolutely, they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, making our way slowly to the present, and uh, you know, the Asian Development Bank um, we know is the, the 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 largest regional development bank in the world, and I think I think yes. I, I had read that the current portfolio of loans is something on the order of 30, 30 billion, 30 billion dollars. Yes. So incredibly impactful for, for many people, you know, who maybe don't fully appreciate the kind of the post world war II Bretton Woods origin and what it should be, what it does and what it is doing in today's world. How can we better understand that? Yeah. So, so ADB, uh, 
unlike, well, the World Bank is really covering the world, uh, the, but the ADB uh, is got a wide uh, sphere. Uh, it is the largest regional bank. Uh, it covers countries all the way from the uh, uh, Central Asia Republic to the Pacific Islands. Uh, 68 member countries, 45 of them are in the region. Uh, and it's, as you said, 30 billion uh, last year of lending. Uh, because of its credit rating, it, has, it can borrow money at a much cheaper rate and, and lend it to countries that don't have that good credit rating, AAA rating. Uh, so countries come to ADB to help. But also ADB has, has a lot of technical uh, capabilities to help. It has been uh, for a long time uh, the, uh, an infrastructure ban bank. Uh, so b countries would borrow to go build roads, to build power plants, uh, to build hospitals. Or, uh, and so uh, it, it is uh, in the last five years, they've actually taken a look at strategy 2030 is what, what uh, is the new uh, is the new normal for them to think about uh, not just infrastructure, but health systems, education. Uh, and then, of course, COVID-19 happened, uh, and it has been very much in the forefront of providing uh, vaccines uh, until recently, uh, until there was a glut of vaccines in the, in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they're very much focused on uh, can, can we or should we actually build capacity in many of these countries to manufacture vaccines for the next pandemic, uh, or uh, focus on education uh, systems. So it's now a much broader bank. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, uh, uh, the, the issues around uh, the uh, climate uh, crisis, uh, it is now being seen as uh, a climate bank. Uh, the president, uh, President Massa, has pledged uh, about a hundred billion dollars mm. uh, to to help countries reduce their carbon footprint uh, and to really uh, bring uh, climate change, both on the adaptation front, but also mitigation uh, of of climate uh, impacts. Do these do these priorities, whether climate or COVID or handling some sort of financial crisis, do they, do they, do you, do you believe they work to support the fundamental purpose of development and, or are they sometimes at odds? Is it, is the organization have a mission creep or are these, do all of these, or would you tell us that all of these pieces are mutual, mutually reinforcing? They're mutually reinforcing, but you got to make sure that they're, you know, you, you're, focus on uh, the impact of what you're trying to achieve. And it's, in the end, it's a poverty reduction uh, organization to ensure that, that many of these countries can have uh, living uh, uh, wage that could uh, economically grow. Uh, and so, yes, climate has a lot to do with it. Uh, in the uh, in, uh, Pacific Island countries, where mm -hmm. it's hugely impactful, if if not some of these countries would go under. Even in countries like Bangladesh, and uh, those countries have uh, also their low lying, uh, mm -hmm. and, and then food security is is a huge problem. If you know uh, floods, uh, weather, severe weather, uh, because of climate change. Uh, and we're seeing the effects already uh, of that in, in, the, in the region. Okay, so we can't talk about Asia Pacific and Asia Pacific economic development without talking about China. And so I think I would say, we would ask, how should we understand both the role of China in the ADB and also whether in some ways the the alternative finance mechanisms like Asia uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, whether they are competition to the ADB? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it, you know, I was, I was at the, this is not my first time to the ADB. Uh, President right. Clinton had appointed me as the alternate executive director there. And then between the 
period of uh, Clinton and Bush, I was actually acting in the role. Uh, so I, <laughs> I'm a little bit familiar with this job. Um, 20 years ago, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the ADB was the only game in town. Uh, it was the lender of choice. Uh, today, it is not. Uh, as you mentioned, AIIB uh, is uh, been there for about five, six years now. Uh, but they're very different. Uh, it's a very different organization in that ADB has a lot of people on the ground. AIIB does not. Uh, and I have mentioned to the president that we need to uh, make sure that a ADB is the lender of choice. Uh, and it's because we provide uh, the, the on the ground partnership to the to the developing member countries. AIIB uh, does work closely with ADB uh, to do co-financing. Uh, and so my goal is to ensure that that uh, ADB uh, uh, and and the, uh, that there's equal uh, access, but also that uh, A AIIB is paying the fair share uh, in terms of this partnership. Okay, and I think la a last question kind of on this topic before we turn our attention to the photography would be, uh, which we're all, you know, looking forward to, um, because so much is going on in Europe and there are, there's real geopolitical strife. And so how has, how has the, Russian invasion of Ukraine. What are the sp spillover effects or the contagion effects yeah. that we're seeing in, in, in Asia? Do you, have, do you have a good good example of that? Yeah, so uh, th the invasion of Russia has direct impacts on some of the countries, uh, particularly the Central Asia Republic countries, uh, where their economies are very tied to Russia, to Russia's economy. Uh, but those that are not p directly tied there are spillover effects, as you mentioned. Uh, the fuel prices, I mean, we're feeling it here, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, but here, e even in the United States. Uh, in Asia, uh, fuel prices have gone up significantly. Uh, food prices have gone up significantly uh, because of, uh, if you would uh, note, that it's fertilizer, access to fertilizers, or, because it's all tied to the to fuel as well. Uh, and in so that in a country like Sri Lanka, uh, the, the, there's been a, actually an a interview of a, a, of a man on the street that he, the fuel prices have gone so high that he can't afford to pay for gas for his mm -hmm. car. So he doesn't drive anymore. And food prices have gone so high that he can't afford to eat but one meal a day. Uh, but that has caused uh, lots of people to actually protest on the street. Sri Lanka has not really come out of their pandemic uh, recovery and now added on this with fuel prices and uh, food price. Uh, it has actually uh, become a political, politically unstable, <laughs> unstable country because of uh, the challenges to this. So the global economy truly is global. Very and tied and, and together, you yes. Can't, you can't <laughs> impact one part of the, uh, the planet without really feeling the effects all the way on the other side of the Pacific. Okay. Um, I think before we move on to the um, photography, just one housekeeping note. If you want to ask a question, I think Megan has passed out a card, and feel free to fill it out or raise your hand for a card. And if you're joining us, via Zoom, then please put your question in the Q&A function and we're gonna try to get to as many as we can. So, okay, so, so then you retired, <laughs> right? I obviously, did. obviously. I have, failed, I have failed in retirement. <laughs> um, what, what led you, I guess, what led you to photography and visual storytelling as, as I see this beautiful, uh, powerful image of the late uh, Representative John John Lewis, of course, an incredible civil rights icon. Um, but what led you into the craft, and what what led you to this um, incredible leader? 
Well, I, I have uh, my sister Connie to blame because <laughs> she told me about uh, uh, about cameras, <laughs> and um, I think uh, uh, we talked about that with the students. That uh, in any society, art and and for, you know, in my case, is photography is really the bleeding edge of an expression of of uh, of the challenges that uh, a. Uh, a community faces or society face. Uh, for me, it has been uh, photography, uh, and I spent a lot of time uh, traveling around the the world into remote locations uh, where people don't actually go. I love to go to red, wet markets, by the way, uh, which may be a dangerous thing to do <laughs> <laughs> uh, in this environment. Uh, but but uh, to really tell the story. Uh, and visually tell the story of those uh, stories that don't get told. Uh, and so uh, I've been to, I've done the Trans-Siberia, Trans-Mongolia, uh, going into, deep into Siberia uh, or uh, into India. Uh, and and um, um, it's been an incredible, uh, really, to, it's my learning of, the, the cultures and the people uh, and their challenges uh, that they, they face daily. Um, and so I, in any, in anything I do, I, uh, you know, <laughs> my friends know this, uh, that I, I get obsessive. I have an obsessive uh, <laughs> uh, personality. So I, I buy all kinds of equipment, uh, and, you know, lenses and camera gear. And one day I was uh, at, uh, photographing at the Martin Luther King Memorial on that day. And a friend of mine said, oh, you're a photographer now? I said, yeah, can't you see? I've got a lot of <laughs> <laughs> camera gear around me. Uh, it turns out that she is the one that, that organizes these pilgrimages mm. for members of Congress with John Lewis. She says, do you want to come along? I said, yeah, uh, I can't pay you. I said, you don't have to pay me. <laughs> I'll come along. Uh, and so that's how it started. So for four years, uh, I was uh, on the ground to Alabama, to Selma, Birmingham, and Montgomery with John Lewis. Uh, this, this one uh, in particular, I think you can ask me about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a powerful, it's a d dark, I mean, it is, a, it is a literally a dark photo um, and, dis and disturbing. Yeah. So this, this photo was taken uh, at, the, uh, at the lynching memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, the slave statues in front of, at the entranceway uh, to, to uh, the lynching memorial. Uh, Brian Stevenson, may, many of you may know, uh, he wrote a book called Just Mercy. Uh, and he was the one that that uh, spent a lot of years trying to, uh, you know, the, the part about incarcer the mass incarceration of African American males, mostly, right, majority males, uh, for crimes that they don't did not commit. Uh, and so, and and then lynching is really a, a earlier manifestation of that. Uh, so he says that we've uh, built monuments to uh, all kinds of. Uh, War, war monuments, but we've never had a, a, a monument or a, a mem memorial to uh, the lynching history in the United States. And so this statue, if you haven't ever, uh, this, this monument, if you've never been to Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, I would urge you to, to go. And uh, at the start of the, the walkway is, are these statues, and they're very, very powerful. Uh, they're made out of, uh, I think it's uh, iron. They've got chains around them, and the weather has really uh, um, uh, caused them to rust. And so you could see the rust coming down their, their bodies. So you can't see it here, but um, uh, this moment was only about two minutes. Uh, he stopped in front of the statues, and he... Uh, what you see on his face, the weight of his people, uh, the, that what they've gone through in history is actually seen on his face uh, uh, and how he really understood that moment in history. Uh, and I saw this scene 
uh, I had already gone around uh, the walkway, and the structure itself is actually these metal structures that have uh, that look like lynching, uh, in, in hanging, uh, many hanging. So, and then in every county in the United States where lynching has occurred, where they found names, uh, they're listed on these metal columns. Uh, and so I was up on the top of the berm already when I saw this scene, and I ran down like a crazy person <laughs> uh, and caught this, caught this image. Uh, and so I had it framed, uh, printed, framed, signed, and uh, gave it to his staff to give to him. And his staff told me he wept when he saw this photo because it was, uh, it brought back what, what he felt that moment. It's just so, it's so powerful and you've really allowed us, I think, you've captured such an essence, it seems, of the man and the struggle and pulled it together and it's, a, it's a, a, really a wonderful gift, I, I think, for all of us and, and so we, we thank you for that. I saw, now this, to me, looks more like photojournalism, I would say. So we, we uh, about 30, 40 members of Congress come along uh, on, these, on this journey. We have a charter flight uh, leaving the Rayburn, uh, get on the bus from the Rayburn building, uh, House Rayburn building, and then we would fly into either Montgomery, this is Selma, uh, Alabama, on the bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that's very famous. Um, and you can see members of Congress there. There's uh, um, uh, Judy Chu, uh, there's uh, Barbara Lee, uh, there's other members that that are are part of this. Mm. Uh, Barbara Lee comes every year, by the way. Um, he, she brings a group of students from the MLK Center uh, to come uh, on this bridge. And to basically, John Lewis invites members of Congress to walk in his footstep to see what it's like uh, to to be there. And he he tells us uh, the stories of of what happened to him. What an incredible uh, opportunity, right, for me to be part of that, that history. Uh, this one is incredible. This, this young man, he was seven years old uh, at the time. Uh, he's, he's an incredible uh, kid now. But uh, th this is uh, 20, 2017, I think. Um, uh, he, with his two grandmothers, drove uh, maybe five hours uh, from Tennessee into Alabama and waited in the hot sun uh, for his hero to show up, for John Lewis to show up. And he had a sign uh, out there and he said, uh, uh, thank you for your courage. Thank you for showing us courage. Uh, and John Lewis came out and it, it, this, this, this is an incredible image. This guy, this boy uh, was changed. His life was changed forever. Uh, and he spoke at John Lewis's funeral, by the way. Um, now we're into your, tra now we're going a little bit yeah. farther afield, right? Uh, yes, f further afield, but this is, uh, this is Cuba. Uh, this is the very famous uh, boxing gym in Cuba. Uh, have you been there? Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, where famous boxers come, uh, and uh, we were there one day, and uh, what an incredible, this woman was nursing her, her child. I know it was a very private moment, <laughs> but I was able to capture, uh, capture that. Uh, by, the, by the way, we have an a incredible photographer in our midst uh, as well, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Jones. <laughs> Ah, this scene. Oh, wow. And I recognize uh, sh Shanghai with, yes. the, with the, uh, the needle. Uh, Shanghai. I went there to do a, a sunrise photo. Uh, this is the bun along the, along the, uh, uh, the river there. Um, you can see modern Shanghai, uh, the needle, uh, but that bottle cap uh, building is Shanghai Tower. It, it is a symbol of modern China, uh, how they have really brought prosperity to its people, 
this scene, the first responders are there because somebody had committed suicide mm. and the body was floating into where they are located. Uh, they're looking. So it's uh, ironic uh, that prosperity is there and, and yet um, people uh, find desperation and not a way out uh, that they have to commit suicide. Um, and the sun was rising. Mm. Very powerful. <laughs> yeah. It, it, w it was very really impactful for me to see the scene, actually, myself. Um. So do you, do, you, do you keep the gear? Is it always with you? When yeah, you're, I when feel you're naked traveling? without so it. I think, uh, so Vita, you have my camera there. Because <laughs> if you see something, you know, compelling, then... Yes. Now, this I, I had understood might have been in India. Yes, this is Jama Masjid, uh, the uh, uh, mosque uh, in uh, old Delhi. Uh, and also, what an incredible uh, experience to be there. Uh, this is right before, you know, millions of people come to the square, by the way. Thank God I was there with, with only two women. <laughs> um, and the w floor was wet. I love the reflection on it. And uh, they, I guess they were feeding the pigeons. Um. <laughs> this is uh, Snowmageddon uh, <laughs> uh, in the, on the Potomac in Washington. Uh, I, I didn't stage this, by the way. <laughs> they were there. And I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, what are they doing there? This is a perfect... A uh, perfect place for me to take a picture. I was I ran over there with knee deep in snow, by the way, and and I was out there for a long time. Uh, I couldn't find a way home. I had to walk home for miles uh, that day because all the uh, roads were blocked uh, because of the snow. Public transportation has stopped. Uh, so I am, as I say, I'm an obsessive, compulsive. <laughs> personality <laughs> when I see a scene I'm I'm there uh, Kevin right <laughs> is that it <laughs> so now, now <laughs> I think we have some questions do we not all right let's see what we have thank you very much thank you Megan okay Okay, as U.S. Executive Director of ADB, how do you manage the significant cultural differences among the member countries mm. as well as among ADB leadership to achieve results? That is the question of the day. Uh, and a lot of it is about relationships. Mm. So I am very much um, anxious to be back on the ground in ADB. Uh, in fact, I'm flying out tomorrow uh, to go back to Manila. Uh, there are a lot of cultural differences. Uh, we have uh, members of the board that are from Australia, Germany, uh, at least the Western nations I'm a little mm -hmm. bit familiar with. Uh, but, but then there's you know, other cultures like Indonesia, and uh, we have members on the board uh, that are from Burma, uh, from from uh, Malaysia, uh, Pakistan, it, it, they're very different. Uh, uh, by the way, b uh, before I got there, uh, they were all men. <laughs> That's a in, in itself a cultural <laughs> challenge. Uh, the only woman on the on the board. Um, it's incredible that uh, when when I left, that we had one woman. Uh, many of you know uh, Linda Yang, uh, Ambassador Yang, uh, was mm -hmm. the first female uh, Asian American to be ambassador at the ADB. Uh, tw Thirty years later, I I'm still the only uh, woman there. So culturally uh, challenged. Uh, so it's about building trust, building relationships. Uh, ultimately, it's about you know, I'm hoping that the, the conversation is about developing uh, the economies that are helpful to the, the developing member countries, to their citizens, right? And that's what we're all there to do. 
uh, and the, that common purpose and that common mission should unite us. This next question is about the United States. Uh, what, what are the U.S. policy objectives for ADB and to what extent do they align with the uh, current ADB operations? Uh, we are, uh, along with Japan, the largest shareholder uh, at, at the ADB. Uh, and, you know, I think it's very clear uh, U.S. has always been the, the generous partner uh, in around the world. Uh, we are there to, to uh, assist uh, other countries uh, in, their, in their development uh, in uh, get, have, having a better life for their people because I think failed states uh, come back to bite us. Uh, and uh, today's challenge, uh, we, have, we have a lot, uh, but they're not different than, than what the member countries are facing, uh, whether it's po COVID recovery, uh, post-pandemic recovery, uh, it's big for us. Uh, food security, actually, we, uh, when, we, when I was in Washington, two weeks ago, uh, we brought everybody together, all the MDB heads together, and all the G7 countries together to look at food security because of the Russian invasion. Uh, food security is now a huge challenge in these countries. So it's, no, it's not different mm. uh, than, than uh, it, it, it's U.S. policy. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I, we have also uh, the, the crisis of climate uh, that's also a, a universal. Uh, even China uh, is is really on track uh, to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, so uh, I think it's a universal effort to bring uh, prosperity and resilience to to that part of the world. Now, this question is really the question I wanted to ask about creatives, artists, and leadership. And it, it, it's phrased, uh, what type of collaboration between your photography as art and work as ambassador would you use to unite the global policies of the Pacific? Yeah, that's a great question. Because I, I think uh, what I'd like to do uh, is actually start an art program, <laughs> uh, bringing emerging artists, uh, bringing their vision of what it is uh, that they see in their communities to ADB. Uh, so I, I actually want to start that program because uh, it, it, as I mentioned to the students er earlier that uh, visual art, uh, art uh, really helps uh, bridge cultural divide, but it also shines a light on, on uh, critical issues and uh, in hopes to spur social change. Uh, is what, you know, some of these images should be doing. Exactly. I have a question here. Maybe we'll take a couple more. Oil and gas are hugely subsidized by governments and banks. And banks. Can banks truly help address climate crisis if they continue to fund oil and gas? Wow, that's a loaded question. Uh, yeah, it's a loaded, it's a loaded question, and we we interestingly find ourselves in a in a in a moment where we have uh, a supply uh, shock mm -hmm. because of geopolitics, and so we're seeing politics that are very much seem topsy turvy in terms of trying right. to trying to you know supply uh, fuel but not trigger inflation but also address climate change. So. Um, what role can you know re regional development banks like ADB pl play? Uh, well, so the the bank is really focused on a lot of it is on uh, adaptation because of the impacts uh, of climate change uh, that is uh, on the developing member countries, and so uh, we have pledged uh, about a hundred billion dollars now to help these countries reduce their carbon footprint, but also to mitigate the effects of, of climate change. Um, it's, it's uh, uh, yes, subsidies uh, don't help. Uh, and how do we get out of that? Uh, it's 
becomes a geo, it becomes a political, uh, actually a local political issue, uh, because you know a lot of people's lives depend on fuel, fuel, uh, and the minute you raise it any level, it, it creates a political challenge for 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 governments. So um, part of it is to keep working at it, I guess. I, have a, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> That's a, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a, this is a small question. Um, what do you think uh, is the biggest economic threat in the future? <laughs> we don't have enough threats now. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I mentioned uh, the, the Are we, uh, uh, climate. Uh, it is really... Um, um, it is our generation to get it right, and if we don't, uh, you know, the 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 world suffers. I think uh, that's going to be my very much uh, my focus um, going going forward. Okay, maybe this will be the last question, and this is I think really focused on ADB's efforts to, or we just talked, we just heard about the composition of the board, but what are some of the efforts, I think, to promote diversity within the organization? How does the ADP insist upon uh, the advancement of communities historically discriminated against, for mm -hmm. example, uh, I think it says paternalism, racism, classism, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Well, so uh, that's a good question because that, that is, uh, one of the major reasons why I came out of retirement. Uh, ADB is going through uh, a review of its safeguards policy. And safeguards is actually to ensure that we do no harm to either environment, uh, labor standards, indigenous people, uh, vulnerable people, uh, to ensure that our projects and our policies go in there hurt the people that we're trying to help. Uh, the last time they did a safeguards review was 10 years ago. And so this is the most opportunity, uh, opportune time for me to be there. Uh, one of the major focus for me, uh, two focuses. Uh, one is uh, what we call uh, a SOGI, uh, gender, uh, se sexually oriented gender identify uh, safeguard where in many countries, LGBTQ uh, communities are targeted, they're criminalized, there's sodomy laws on the books, uh, there's, uh, they're, they're targeted uh, and trumped up charges, uh, they have no access to, because of that, they, they're afraid to come out, uh, they don't have access to health uh, institutions or education, they're discriminated against, and, uh, they're the vulnerable of the vulnerable. And so our goal with uh, a safeguard is to ensure that vulnerable people, including uh, uh, LGBTQ, uh, are not harmed. Uh, whether, you know, give an example of uh, uh, COVID uh, vaccines, how do we ensure that this, this community have access to vaccines? Because they're afraid to come out. And the governments are targeting them. Uh, how do you get to them, uh, given that situation? Uh, so that's a safeguard that I, I'm going to be very much focused on. Uh, the the other safeguard is, of course, climate. I, I keep going back to climate. Uh, climate uh, is not just uh, doing climate projects, uh, but that everything we do, we have to look through a climate lens. If you're building a road, how does that impact climate? Uh, and that's going to be a very important. Uh, so uh, th this process is, the review process is ongoing now, uh, and it's supposed to be done by, by the uh, uh, spring of next year. Uh, and so I decided that I have a, an opportunity to make an make a imprint and, make, uh, and be, be part of the, the change that needs to happen in, in that region. Well, we're incredibly grateful that you have and that you've come out of retirement and we're grateful for your, your leadership and your voice and your example and for joining us tonight uh, with, with a very busy schedule. 
So thank you, uh, Ambassador Wong, and thank you everyone for joining us here and at home, and a, and a special um, recognition and thanks to the State Treasurer Fiona Ma for joining us as well. So thank you from World Affairs.